This is WBAA, I'm Mike Lewitzo. Joining me in studio is Peg Ertmer, a professor of educational technology at Purdue and the editor of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Problem-Based Learning, published by Purdue University Press. Thanks so much for coming in, Peg. You're welcome. Now, a lot of people probably don't know, what is problem-based learning? That's a great question to start with. Problem-based learning is, basically, it's the learning that occurs when you try to solve a problem. So, in a curriculum, the problem actually anchors the curriculum. And students, people use it for two main reasons, because students can learn content and learn it well, and because it helps develop those higher order thinking skills that we want students to develop. So it's been around for a long time. It started in um, McMaster University in the medical school, and uh, there was some dissatisfaction with the way doctors were learning lots of facts, but not able to apply what they were learning. And so problem-based learning was kind of an alternative to that, where they learned the information while they were applying it. It seems like uh, hands-on training in some regard. To, it, to some extent it is, absolutely. There's definitely that hands-on, that active involvement. You try to use an authentic problem so that it doesn't feel fake to the students, and it's something that they would encounter in real life, so the hope is that they'll transfer the process that they use to solve that problem to other problems. Now, the Interdisciplinary Journal of Problem-Based Learning started uh, several years ago. Why? the need for it. Why did you all start it? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons why this journal made sense, but I'd say one of the main reasons was that there really wasn't a central um, resource in which to publish scholarship about problem-based learning. Every discipline may publish something about innovative teaching methods, um, but the disciplines weren't talking to each other. So people in chemistry might publish something about using problem-based learning in chemistry, and people in business would publish, but the you know journals don't tend to cross these disciplines very well, and so there's really an emphasis here on the interdisciplinary journal. We're really trying to bring people from all these disciplines together so that they can share the knowledge and the wisdom that they've gained from using this approach. And when you say disciplines, are you talking about everything? Absolutely. I mean, it should apply to almost anything, but the places where it's most prevalent right now is, of course, medicine, as I mentioned earlier. And that would include nursing and pharmacy and dentistry, et cetera. Um, business, pretty um, prevalent there, although case-based instruction is similar, not quite exactly the same. Um, it's become much more prevalent in education and at all levels. So I'm, I'm really talking about you know, the, the gamut, if yeah. you will. So what was it like starting a journal? I don't know what your previous experience, if you're a journal starter by nature or what? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, no, not at all. It was um, take it a step at a time because I absolutely did not know what I was doing or getting into. Um, it really started before me. So I think in like 1999 or so, there was a, a special interest group that formed, was part of what was then CIS, the Center for Instructional Services, now Center for Instructional Excellence. And they had brought in a speaker, Don Woods, who's a big proponent of problem-based learning in Canada at McMaster. I think he's in chemical engineering or, or something like that, possibly chemistry. Um, and they had brought this speaker in, and they were just fired up about problem-based learning. And I think they started doing some actual projects and gathering some data, and it's like, where should we publish this? And they couldn't find a source that was really doing the kinds of things that they wanted to do. So the people that were involved at that point, Alexis Macklin was an assistant professor in the libraries. Joseph Lalopa um, is faculty in hotel tourism, man um, hotel tourism management. And there was a visiting scholar from Turkey at the time, Eifer Alper. And the three of them kind of you know, joined forces and said, let's just start our own. And because Alex was from the libraries, had a background in library science, she knew at least some of the steps that it would take to start a journal. She applied for an ISS. ISSN number, um, which, you, you know, it's basically kind of like an ISBN number. It files the journal's name with the Library of Congress, puts it on the book, so to speak, and that then it just kind of sat there for a while. So at some point, I think probably in 2004, Alex approached me and asked if I'd be willing to serve on the editorial board. She's trying to, to get people together who have a reputation in problem-based learning so that you can say, this journal has credibility, because look at who's on the board. So I thought, OK, that doesn't sound too hard. I can do that. 
And then for whatever reason, life intervened or whatever, um, Joe Lalopa dropped out, Eifer went back to Turkey, and Alex was kind of there holding the ball and said, would you consider being a co-editor? So, yeah, I hesitated. I said, I don't know anything about starting a journal. I, I have no idea. And she, But we kind of said, well, let's just take it a step at a time, and we'll see what happens. So our process was we talked to lots of people. We talked to our deans. We talked to our department heads. We talked to Tom Bacher at the Purdue Press, which we'll probably talk a little bit more about later. Um, we talked to people at um, AERA. It's our big um, educational conference. They have a special interest group on problem-based learning. And everywhere we went, they encouraged us. Nobody said, oh, heavens, don't try to do that. They all said, absolutely, you know, how can we help? And so, again, just kind of a step at a time. Um, after I came on board, it probably was a year and a half before we finally published the first issue. So there's definitely a lot of groundwork that you have to do to, to get things in order. And for those who don't know, there's the editorial board. I'm guessing you have some sort of advisory board, and you've got specific editors, correct? Like a book review editor? Um, that is true, but our editorial board um, served as an advisory board, okay. actually. Um, so decisions about you know, whether we should make this um, online or print, and all those kinds of big decisions you make at the beginning, we consulted with the editorial board. I think that was about six to eight people at the beginning. And then we had a, a set of editorial reviewers who you will send manuscripts to. They'll give you, um, it's a blind review. They'll give you your their thoughts and decisions about whether we should accept the manuscript or not. So that was a whole other group of people. Um, we now have a book editor. We did not at the time. We didn't do book reviews at the beginning. But So the main groups were the reviewers and the editorial board. This is part of the Purdue University Press 50th anniversary how does Purdue Press help you? Why was the decision made to go with Purdue Press? Well, again, it was part of that one step at a time. And um, Alex know, knew Tom Bacher, the director at the time, very well. I mean, the Purdue Press actually sits, it's governed, it's under the library um, auspices. So um, basically, they're, they're in the same college, sure. if you will. She knew Tom. Let's go talk to Tom and just see what he says. And. I think the reason I never even considered going anywhere else is Tom was, he just believed in us from the beginning. He saw the value. He offered whatever kind of support he could provide. He, um, you know, talked about how he would market it, how he'd um, keep it open at the beginning so that people became familiar with it. It wasn't going to be any upfront cost, which for me at the beginning that was very important because I didn't have funds for this. I was you know, giving the time out of my hide, if you will. So he was just so supportive. And of course, he knew the steps that needed to be taken. And so I felt like, OK, he can help direct us through this process. And um, it, it was an easy decision. Now, this is an open access journal, mm -hmm. which means it's basically no charge for it for, right. for users. Right. How does that uh, play into the, the, the business model, if you will? I mean, does this open you up to more avenues? more submissions come out of that? Um, in theory, I think that would be true. Um, the main advantage I see to open access is people can find you. They can read your work. You know, They have access to this information. So if you put um, PBL Journal into Google, for example, IJPBL is the first thing that comes up. Um, and they can get any article that's been published, and they can read it. And we have quite a wide readership. We have a lot of international students or faculty who access our journal who probably wouldn't have access through their libraries. Um, practitioners use our journal. Again, K-12 teachers probably aren't going to have access like university faculty do. And so it makes it readily available to all kinds of people and people who really care about using problem-based learning. So that's a real plus for us is it generates that interest. It, gets it out where it needs to go. Um, in terms of submissions, I, I think ideally it would lead to lots of submissions um, because, again, people are familiar with it. That's a little slower in coming, although um, so we've been in operation. Our first issue was published in 2006. Um, we've had over 200 submissions, which 
compared to big journals is not a lot, but isn't bad for where we are. We're still fairly small. We're still, I think we're still young and starting. Um, so the submissions, and we do get a lot of international submissions, which probably attest to the fact that they can find it, they can read it, they see the kinds of things that we're doing. So it, um, okay, but it's not free. You know, it's not free to produce. It's free to right. read. So we, there are costs involved, and that was one thing I really liked about Tom at the beginning. He was like, don't worry about it when we go to a subscription model, you know, we'll recoup that or we'll, you know, we'll take pro some of the profits at that point, but we're not going to worry about it at first. He says it takes three years to get a journal really established. And he was willing to ride that with us. Of course, he left uh, two years <laughs> after we got started. But, um, and, and then the, the person, or it was a different economic situation when the next person came in, um, not as convinced that this is the way to go. I mean, somebody has to provide the funds to edit it, typeset it, etc. Even if it's just online, you still need to do that. So um, we've looked for other sources of funding to help with that piece. Again, Purdue Press did it for a number of years, but they're kind of ready to say, okay, you got to help us with this. So. Fairly recently, um, I approached uh, the, I don't know if he's called a president, um, let's say the president of the Teaching Academy here at Purdue. Their mission is to promote um, innovative teaching and learning and ask them if they ever supported some, you know, kind of had recurring costs to support something um, that would be in line with their mission. And Jamie Moeller, who was the president at the time, took it to the board and they did approve um, funds for us to produce the journal for three years. So we've just that just went into effect, I think June 1st. So we're really excited about that. It gives us time again to look at other funding models. We might consider advertising or some journals do like a pay per use. I'm really hesitant to do that because I think the people that really benefit from open access wouldn't be able to pay. And so I'd like to find other models than charge the user. How does a journal grow? I mean, I guess what are the plans for the future other than the funding yeah. revenue? Um, how do you expand this? Is yeah. it it's semi-annual, correct? This this is correct. We started thinking it would be uh, four times a year and um, had to back off a little bit because we weren't getting enough sure. um, submissions at, at the beginning. You know, it's a lot of it's a lot of hard work, to be honest. And a lot of talking to people, a lot of tapping into the people that are really invested in problem-based learning, and asking them to spread the word at conferences, at um, through their listservs, you know, their professional organizations, that type of thing. So, at this point, it's been a small group of people: the editorial board, myself. I have an editorial assistant, Chris Mong, and we've just kind of pounded the pavement a bit. Again. As articles become um, more accessible or people find the newer issues, etc., people start thinking, oh, you know, maybe this, this would be a good journal I could submit to. I'll tell you that one of the um, hesitations that young faculty have is it's not indexed yet. And when they have to show evidence of impact of, you know, their work, we don't have an impact factor yet. I don't know if you're familiar with no, that. No, go ahead and explain that a little. Well, it's it's a measure of how often the journal, the articles in the journal are cited, and that's putting it very simply. But um, a journal has to be in existence for at least, uh, I think it's two years of consecutive publications. So if we start out with four a year, and then we we weren't able to meet that, so there was a gap. Okay. So we basically had to start over for our two years of consecutive or consistent publication. Um, so once we get indexed, and we're in that process now, I think that's part of the growth. Um, then people who have hesitated because it doesn't, you know, doesn't show up in right. citation indexes will not hesitate. I hope. Word of mouth, you know, just the normal kinds of advertising things you can do. Looking back, uh, and again, it's only been a few years, but. Anything you'd do different or something you've learned out of this process? Probably learned a lot. But I have <laughs> learned a lot. Um, it's a lot more work than I thought <laughs> right. it would be. Um, but it's also very doable, especially with a good assistant and good supportive, um, well, first of all, administration behind me and um, 
key people on the editorial board. So it, it's a lot more work than I thought. Tom Barker said it takes three years to get a journal started. Well, we're into year, let's see, we, I came on board in summer of 05. So that's 10 years. I mean, excuse five me, years. five years. And um, we're not established yet. You know, I, I had said, okay, I can give three years. That's not too bad. And after three years, when it's well established, I'll turn it over to someone else. Because I didn't intend to do this for life, you know. I don't think we're there yet. Um, we're getting closer. We did just bring on a, a new co-editor. Um, I felt like the work was getting um, a little more intense. You know, there's certainly periods where we have a lot more activity going on and felt like I could, could benefit from having a co-editor. So Michael Grant, who's at the University of Memphis, has joined as a co-editor. I guess that's part of the growth as well, you know. Um, because we should say that you're not just an editor. You're a professor, you're teaching right. classes, you're doing your own research. Right, right. You probably have a life outside of the office. I try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have been supported in terms of, um, I didn't ever get salary or summer salary or anything like that. A lot of it's been a labor of love. But um, my department has given me a course release um, once a year for the last couple years. So those things help in terms of the time because that's the biggest issue is finding the time to do it. Um, it's not a hard job, especially once you've done it a few years. You kind of know the flow. You you know you have a better understanding of of how to make decisions on manuscripts or whatever. I don't struggle over that like I did at the beginning, um, but it's just time, you know, and trying to find that. Okay, Peg Ertmer is the prof is a professor of educational technology at Purdue and the editor co-editor I guess right now yes. Peg <laughs> of the interdisciplinary journal of problem based learning published by Purdue University Par Press. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, Mike. You're listening to WBAA. I'm Mike Lowitzo.